Hello. Yes, this is my talk on the international consensus data and the generation of uh, high energy photon KQs combining both measured and modeled data. So disclosures, I have no conflict of interest and nothing to disclose. I want to begin this with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which this work was performed. I want to acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the first scientists of this, of this land and they've been practicing and studying their science for, for many tens of thousands of years. Apanza is located on the lands of the Woiwurrung language groups of the Kulin Nation, and their office is based in Yulambi in Melbourne or Nam. Gadi is the name of the high plowed cluster we use that's based at NCI at the Australian National University, and that is situated on Yanawal country or Canberra. I also really like the, the name of that computer cluster, Gadi. It means to search for in the traditional Yanawal language. As a brief outline for this talk, we're going to talk about why updated high energy photon KQ values are needed, any other beam qualities uh, outside the scope of this work. We're going to talk about what was performed and what Arpanja contributed towards this consensus data set. We're going to talk you through a quick summary of what the new data is and what it means for, for clinical use of this, both in the Australian New Zealand context where we have direct calibration services and elsewhere where there's only a cobalt NDW service available. So the motivation of this work is to achieve the most accurate dosimetry possible. We know that the reference dosimetry step in the clinic is the, the first step in the chain that results in the dose being delivered to the patient. Every further interaction in that chain, so the beam modeling and so on, depends on the ability to be able to accurately measure this dose. Any inaccuracies or uncertainties in the reference dosimetry step carry through and result in a larger uncertainty or a, a difference in the, the dose that's being delivered to the patient. We care about this because we want to be targeting that therapeutic window where you have maximum tumour control while minimising any um, adverse reactions of the patient. We also know that a 7% dose error is observable in patient outcomes directly. This is the TG65 case study where there were 67 gynecological patients receiving external beam photons of 25 MV energy and many of these patients had adverse skin reactions and diarrhoea. So we know that having an error in dose can be visible in a, a small cohort of 67 if the error is large enough. We know that the dose response is sigmoidal, so a small change in the dose can cause a large change in the tumour control probability or an increase in any adverse effects. Um, of course, this is site and stage dependent. We know that when the patient, number, patient numbers increase, so a larger patient cohort, any smaller effects can be observable as they become more statistically significant. KQ is important here because it affects many different treatments across many different clinics. Anywhere that does not have a direct calibration service like our PANZA offices means that everyone is using the same KQ set from a protocol and if there's an error in that it will propagate through to any clinic using that KQ value having an error in their dosimetry or a larger uncertainty or inaccuracy in their dosimetry. So being able to maximize the accuracy here is obviously very important. It's also motivated by the publication of RCAU Report 90, which necessitates changes so that there is consistency across the entire dosimetry chain, even though we expect the differences to be small. There's been many new chambers placed on the market since the publication of TRS-398, so allowing KQs to be put in a protocol for that too is important. TRS-398 was written in 2000 and updated 2006, and the KQs in there were calculated with Bragg Gray approximations and cavity theories, so any improvements or um, ways to do that more accurately is good. And as there is more availability in Monte Carlo, both programs and research groups and high quality data, uh, the ability to be able to do this with Monte Carlo is, is improved more and more. It's a collaborative piece of work. We do want consensus values for KQ. We want to be looking at both measured KQ values and simulated KQ values to get a more representative sample. This involved a wide range of contributors, uh, both primary standards laboratories and research groups around the world. You can see here both Chris and myself are the Arpanza representatives on the paper, and there are many other Arpanza staff that are acknowledged in the acknowledgements of the paper for their contributions to this work. So here's a, a look around the world of where all the different research groups are from. You can see Arpanza really doing one for the Southern Hemisphere team. So what did Arpanza contribute towards this consensus data set? So Arpanza contributed multiple simulated KQ data points, 
These are all simulated with the EGS NRC program EGS Chamber. All of the chambers are modelled explicitly from manufacturer's blueprints and specifications. And in each case, for each chamber and energy, we model the dose to the chamber and dose to a water volume. So what's involved in this step is we have to take the manufacturer's specifications or blueprints, so there's a very detailed drawings as seen here, and turn them into an equally detailed Monte Carlo model so that we can use that in the simulations to get the most accurate possible understanding of the, the radiation propagation and dose deposition in the ionization chambers. So for these simulated KQ values, we've calculated 10 different MV energies, plus cobalt 60 of course, for each chamber. So this, these 10 come from three different Arpanza energies in a, a full LINAC model, that's 6, 10 and 18 MV, as well as seven published structure, spectra, in a range of energies from 4 to 25 MV. We've modelled nine different chamber types, so 10 different MV energies in nine chambers gives us 90 simulated KQ data points, and the KQ value is the ratio of the ratio from simulations. So dose to water over dose to cavity in your beam quality crew, Q, over the dose to water and cavity in cobalt 60. For each chamber, we've also calculated the FCH in cobalt 60, which is essentially the denominator from the previous equation, so the dose to water over the dose to cavity in cobalt 60. This allows a calculation of, a more accurate calculation of a KQ for protons and heavy ions. So the smaller uncertainty, this new consensus value has an uncertainty of 0.4% compared to the 0.8% in TRS-398. Um, it's also good because a consistent set of the FCH values is preferred over calculating the stopping power ratios and the perturbation corrections um, every single time. And it also means that there's sort of more consistency in those calculations. It's important to note that for protons and heavy ions, there isn't really the same sort of consistent data sets um, across multiple different groups that has been available in this, in this work. So for consistency with the ICRU report 90, we have modelled the renormalised photoelectric effect cross sections. We've used the new mean excitation energy values for graphite and water, and we've used the density effect for graphite at the bulk density, not the density that appears in the chambers. The run times for the tabulated spectra were in the order of six to 900 hours per chamber, so that's combined across all the energies. And for the BMNRC LINAC models, they were closer to three and a half thousand hours per chamber. The statistical uncertainties for each point we submitted were less than 0.1%, and that's per KQ point. So the measured KQs we've submitted were collected as part of our routine calibration services. So the KQ in the, the measured sense is the NDW in MV over the MDW in cobalt 60. So you can see on the right hand side, this is essentially a copy of a report that will be issued. And there are the three KQ values for the three Arpanza energies. And in each case, we've provided these values as an average KQ we've measured across different chamber types. So for this, we've submitted 97 different calibrations across eight different chamber types, which means we have 24 different measured KQ data points. So that's six, 10 and 18 MV by eight chambers. And this is important to note, this is a unique service offered by primary standards dosimetry laboratories. It does require traceable calibration services in both MV and cobalt 60. So what's the What's new? What's the data that's been uh, produced in this consensus group? So the consensus data is combining 725 simulated KQ data points and 179 measured KQ data points. And this is including both with flattening filter and flattening filter free beam qualities. It's good to note that Arpanza has contributed 13% of the measured data points and 12% of the simulated data points. On the right hand side, there's a representative figure for the 2571 thimble chamber. And you can see that there's good agreement between most of the data points, which shows there's a good agreement between the different research groups and between the Monte Carlo and the experimental data collected. In each case, so for each chamber, there's been a fit to all data performed, and the agreement for that fit is mostly within 0.5%, and across all of them, there's a mean RMS difference of 0.2%. In the paper, there is KQ data and FCH and cobalt 60 data for 23 different thimble chambers, as well as FCH and cobalt 60 for nine different plane parallel chambers. The KQ in the paper is presented in two formats. There is a tabulated format, uh, as you would be familiar with from the current TRS-308 protocol, as well as function fits with coefficients A and B, using equation six on the right-hand side of this slide, where you can fit uh, any, so you have a KQ as a function of TPR 2010. This calculation will allow you to calculate KQ for any beam quality in both with flattening filter or flattening filter free beams. The detail for this will be in the updated protocol. 
So in this consensus data set, we've shown a combined standard uncertainty of 0.62%, which is a smaller uncertainty in KQ than seen in the TRS-398 protocol. This is a conservative uncertainty. We do see a lot closer to 0.4% for some chambers that have more data in the, the data set. Uh, and to note, the Panzer Direct Calibration Standard Uncertainty is 0.4%, so it's, again, lower. But also, very importantly, the Direct Calibration Service we offer allows you to have a KQ, KQ values generated for your chamber, not for a generic chamber of that type. So what does it mean, and how is it going to be useful in the clinic? So if you have chamber-specific measured KQs, i.e. the ones that we provide when you get your secondary standard calibrated at our Panzer, we would recommend that you continue to use these as they are chamber specific and they match your chamber um, as opposed to a generic chamber. So any small differences that might exist can be accounted for. And remember that the TRS-398 update is not published yet. So the current published protocol does not recommend these values explicitly, but they have been provided um, so that you may use them if you wish. For flattening filter free beams, the TRS-398 updated protocol will have one set of KQ values per ionization chamber type, and the protocol will import the volume averaging uh, correction factor KVOL, which you can read up on in TRS-483. The full details of this will of course be included in the updated protocol. So in summary, the TRS-398 updated protocol with the new KQ values is on the way, but I am not on the group, so I do not know when. Please don't ask me. Our PANS have contributed roughly 12.5% of the data points for this consensus data set. And if you have any direct calibrations from our calibration service, please keep using these. Thank you very much for listening to my talk, and please enjoy a couple of my submissions to the, the AppSeq Strava Art Fun Run competition from this year's conference. Thank you.